Hey, listen, real quick, I want to talk to you about something that I, that I find a very fascinating. Oftentimes, I think about Deborah and I being a, a um, what, what the Bible calls is a living testimony for Jesus Christ. You know, as you get older and life is, is very prosperous in every area, then, then you look back at your life and you say, what are some of the things that we did that were outstanding? And what are the things that uh, brought about, like this church, for an example, that at one time had 24,000 people in it in attendance, about 18,000 a week. Now we're down a bit. Pastor Dan's a wonderful pastor, bringing it back up, doing a hard, great job as he does. As he's a great preacher, by the way. And bringing it up, we probably have 15 or 16,000 in a week, maybe even sometimes less than that. But yet it's wonderful. God's doing great things. Thousands, tens of thousands of people getting saved. Touch the world. This church, San Bernardino, a no, a no place church, uh, and touch the world. I mean, people, as you'll see, I mean, the Hillsong churches all over, great churches everywhere, uh, they all have been touched by what The Rock has done over the years. And so it's a living testimony is what we seem to be. And we've lived this life that is successful and prosperous in terms of the things of God, which, by the way, is real success. Not success what we want, but success what he wants. And when you do what he wants and you become successful at it, now you're a very prosperous person. And so Debbie and I oftentimes look at things. We talked over the years about areas of our life. And I thought it would be important tonight, because I'm not often in front of you, to be able to share with you some of the things that we did and that the Bible calls out for all of us to do in order for us to live this life of purpose and this life of meaning. I don't know about you, how many of you could ask yourself right now, do you want to live a life of purpose and do you want to live a life of meaning? I mean, so many people live lives and they really end up doing nothing in their life, end up not really ever having anything, really have no fulfillment, no friends, no joy, no peace. They have nothing. They're just simply miserable and full of fear in their old age. But, you know, that's not the way it's supposed to be. There is a life, literally, that God calls us to, a life of great divine purpose. In fact, that's the message, if you will, for tonight. It's entitled, if you're making notes, and you should be making notes, it's called Divine Purpose for My Life. And for every one of us, here's five little things that I've thought about over the last couple of weeks that I could identify to each one of you that you could see and easily put to work, appropriate in your life. So let's take a look at something if we can, because it's so important for us to do what God would have us to do. And as we look at the scripture tonight, just not our life, but the scripture, our life just reflects what God had us to do. We want your life to reflect, at the end of your life, reflect what God had you to do. So there are five little things, what we should look to do. Mike, make that note, what we should look to do, and then we'll name these five things real easy for you to follow and consider whether or not you're doing it in your life so that at the end of your life, you can say, wow, I'm prosperous, I'm really successful, I'm really happy, I'm really fulfilled, and man, I love God more today than I ever did, and I hear from God more today than I ever did. Number one thing that I felt like Debbie and I did and so God requires of all of us is that we serve God. Number one thing is that we serve God. A lot of times we serve an idea or we serve a philosophy. We serve our job. We serve our education. We serve our relatives. We serve our friends. A lot of times we serve a lot. We do a lot of work for things and for people, but this is a real key word, is that we serve God. That God becomes number one in everything that you do. Every choice you make, God becomes number one. And you know, we started this life, Debbie and I, as most of you know the testimony, we both failed in so many areas of our life, got married, and the one commitment we made is that for the rest of our life, her and I wanted to do nothing more than serve God didn't want to serve my passions. Listen to me now. I didn't want to serve my wants, even though I was filled with them. I didn't want to serve my ideologies and philosophies. And in those days, I had many of them. 
What I wanted to do more than anything is I wanted to serve the living Christ with all of my heart and all of my life. And I met a woman who didn't want to serve parties or serve friends or just hang around and, you know, uh, didn't want to make money and spend money and do that stuff, you know. But she really wanted more than anything to serve God. And here's this interesting verse found in Joshua. Let's go to the Old Testament for a moment, then we'll jump into the New Testament. Let's take a look. And Joshua, if you will, in the 24th chapter, verse 15, which was really kind of the verse for our family. It says, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord. Do you know how many people it seems evil to serve the Lord? You know why it's evil? Because it's contrary to their thinking. Contrary to their feeling. Contrary to what they want. I mean, they don't want to go to church on Sunday. They don't want to get up and go to church and fight the traffic and be there on Wednesday to get a hold of the Word of God. In fact, uh, what, anything that's contrary to what they want, it actually seems to them evil. He says, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose yourself this day. And it's interesting for all of us. Choose yourself. Somewhere along the line, you and I are going to have to make the right choice. We're going to either keep serving the world, serving the way of the world, serving life that we know it in the natural and physical, based upon what men say, instead of serving God. He said, assume whom you will to serve, whether the gods, notice the capital, the small g on the word gods. It's not the God that you know. It's a small g God, which means it's not the God of the creator of the heavens and the earth, the Son of God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Whether the gods, notice the S on the word gods up there. They served a lot of gods. And you know something, in America, there's a lot of gods out there. There's money, you know, there's fortune, there's fame. Uh, you know, there's the internet God, there's all kinds of advertising God, there's, there's all kinds of d gods, and sometimes our wants become something that we serve more than anything else. It said, serve, if you will, the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river. Now, go on to B, please. Or the gods of the Amorites in which the land you dwell. In other words, I gave you the promised land and drove out those enemies and now here you are in a place of blessing and God has to speak to you like this? Wouldn't it be obvious that if God brought you to a place of blessing that you would serve God with all of your heart? I would think so. But you'd be surprised how many people get blessed and walk away from God and live in that temporary blessing that they got instead of the fullness of what God is. And he says this, in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. My kids, and a lot of you, um, you know, one of the things that we can say to all of you, some of you don't know us, but all of our kids are, are grew up serving the Lord. It's just amazing. I didn't, I'm, I'm as amazed about that as you are because I really half the time wanted to knock the snot out of them. They were probably no different than any of your kids. In fact, you know, Pastor Jessica, how many love Pastor Jessica? Well, let me tell, let me tell you, I wanted to knock her out as her dad. I mean, God had to stop me. I was going to knock that girl out. She drove me nuts, that big mouth of her, just, oh, just going and going. Yeah, I, I love this one. When she was young, she'd go, well, uh, how did she put that? She'd go, well, uh, what did she say? Talk to the hand. Talk to the hand. I said, I'm going to talk to your butt girl in a minute here. You know? And she, listen to this. I know she's wonderful. We all love her now, and she's beautiful, and she's anointed, and she preached the gospel, and she's amazing and all that, but I'm going to tell on her because she's not here. That girl drove me nuts. I mean, she drove me nuts. She drove her brother nuts. She drove everybody nuts. She was absolutely a stinker. When she was 18 years old, I did not know what to do with her. She was so wild. I threw her out. I said, that's it. Now you say, you, don't, you know, as a parent, it's like you deal with your kids. You can either let your kids get away with stuff. And I didn't let my kids get away with stuff, so I threw her out. You know, and she 
she moved in with the older daughter, Kimberly, and they had an apartment together somewhere around here. And uh, they had to learn how to pay their bills. They had to learn how to work. <laughs> how about this one? They had to learn how to shut off the air conditioning when they left. They had to <laughs> learn how to turn off the lights. Hello, how many fights do you have over the lights? You know, and so, I mean, she, so and today, I mean, she's just committed to God and loves God with all of her heart. So here's what I'm, what I'm trying to say to you. She grew up with this verse. My son Luke, Pastor Luke, you know him, you all love him. You all think he's wonderful and think he's great and he's a bit bubble. Yeah, I smacked that kid too. And uh, <laughs> that kid couldn't mow a lawn if it killed him. I mean, I had to make him do it two, three times. He hates lawnmowers. It's like, he, Luke, I'm telling you to mow the lawn. I'm thinking to myself, if he can't even mow the lawn, what's he going to grow up to be? <laughs> Did dad ever thought that besides me? You know? Then I said, what's he going to grow up to be? And I, he, he'd mow the lawn. I said, you finished? I said, yeah, let's go look at it. I said, you missed that patch over there? And you go, man. And it, I mean, I knew he disliked me horribly. <laughs> I'm still not sure he's gotten over it. <laughs> and so, but here he is, pastoring, preaching the gospel, uh, taking tours into Israel, working for the government of Israel. I mean, preaching with uh, all over the world, famous. And how's that happen? Because this part of the verse was part, we, when we poured concrete in our house, anywhere in our houses, this woman sitting on the front row, the good-looking blonde, Mm, mama, you turn on, Grandpa. <laughs> it's not that I can do anything about it, but nevertheless, you still turn me on. <laughs> so, <laughs> shut up, we're family. <laughs> and so, it, 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 she would take the, uh, I would have concrete poured out, finished concrete, you know, just be beautiful. And she'd put in there these words, but as for me, in my house, we will serve the Lord, Joshua 24, 50. I said, how do you expect me to sell that house? I mean, it's like a billboard in the backyard. <laughs> it's amazing. It's just amazing. It was part of our life. We made that commitment. We made sure our children followed that, understood it. Luke wanted to, I mean, who plays ice hockey out here in the Inland Empire? He wanted to be an ice skater. Then he wanted to be a snowboarder. Who does snowboarding, you know, for a profession and living forever? <laughs> Come on. I mean, I, it's, it's, so he becomes a snowboarder. He wants me. So, he, so when he was playing sports, you know, he says, Dad, come to my game. He said, I'm not coming to your game. It's Sunday. And by the way, you're living in my house, eating my food. That's my energy. You ain't playing the game either. You're going to church on Sunday. And they went to church like this. I hate church. I hate my dad. I hate my mom. Today, I look at them, they're going. Because, listen, it's, I'm telling you the truth. Is that okay? But I made the statement. You got to come to a place where you're going to choose something in life. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. <laughs> Number two, what we should look to do. Number two is seek God's kingdom. When I was a businessman in Santa Barbara, I, if you can believe this, some of you don't know this, but I lived in Montecito. I didn't live on Montecito. Montecito looked down on Santa Barbara. That's the wealth. Oprah lives in Montecito. This gives you an idea. Lived in Montecito. I lived on the beach in Montecito. Had my business was successful as a 20-year-old, 25-year-old man in Montecito, California, on the beach, right? So I go and I pray and I ask God. I said, God, I need to buy a car. I need you to give me a car. But I'm going to go to an auction down in Los Angeles, see if I can find a car. I'll never forget it. And I wanted a certain kind of car, and God just bumped it up. I put a, I put a freaky bid on, a, on a, this Cadillac Seville, 1976, I think it was, Cadillac Seville. Like, it was the most beautiful car on the road in those days. Today, you would all laugh at it. But nevertheless, it was the most beautiful car on the road that day. It turned heads. It had spoke wheels. I know, you don't think much of smoke wheels. Nowadays, you like black wheels. 
What's that all about? But nevertheless, <laughs> it had spoke wheels, man. I mean, I went down the street, and it was like I had all the tools. I was single, and, uh, and I didn't know what to do. So I, I, I was embarrassed to go around Christians, because Christians always judge you. And I was a new Christian myself, and they're looking, oh, this guy's really into material things, and, you know, he's really a loser. And uh, so I decided to get a license plate, and I call, and I'm the license plate. I still have the license plate, Matthew 6.33. And here's what Matthew 6.33, one of my, and I've never regretted this since a young Christian, this verse has become alive to me. It says, but seek first. I love that. What do you seek in life? Have you ever thought about it? Wait a minute. What do you seek in life? Someday you ought to sit with God and say, God, show me what it is that I seek. And God will say, it's simple. Let's look at your checkbook. Show me what it is that I seek, God. And it says this, but seek first the kingdom of God. I mean, that's just not something that most people think about. The kingdom of God is usually something that's, you know, it's in your life and you understand that's a kingdom that you don't quite understand. And for most people that call themselves Christian, have no concept of what even the kingdom is or the king. And, uh, but it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not my righteousness, not the world's righteousness, but his righteousness. And then, and then he comes along and he makes this state. And all these things shall be added to you. And that was my witness to all those Christians that judge me. Now, you can judge me all you want, but I'm seeking God first, and God gave me this car. You know, and it was like, pfft, I don't care what, and never have cared since then what people think of me. Call me all kinds of names, write articles about me, do videos about me. Just the more they do, the more I laugh because nothing but the devil. Uh, so, because who in the world has the ministry of judgment and criticism in the Bible? Nobody. So anybody that operates in judgment and criticism is a fool. And guess what, my friends? It is wonderful to seek first. Make a choice. Remember, who will you choose? Seek first, not second, not third, not down the road, but seeking first the things of God. I need to have God. I need to put him first. I, I'm tired tonight. I'm going home, and my body says it needs to rest and maybe watch some television on the couch. I've worked hard. My boss really stinks, uh, so I'm going to put myself first and go home. No, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then, he says, I love that, all these things be added on to you. Number three, we're talking about what we should look to do in order to have the divine purpose for my life and your life. It's what make it personal. Number three, do Father's will. Every day, you're going to be a choice between doing your will and your want and your desires and doing his. Tonight, when you came to church, some of you haven't even had dinner but you made a choice to do the Father's will, to get into the presence of the Holy Spirit, just for fun, just for fun. I'd like to show you, because I don't know if you missed a meal tonight or didn't miss a meal, but raise your hand. I want you to raise your hand if you didn't get a meal tonight and you came to church anyway. Could you just raise your hand? See this? This is what I'm saying. Seek first the Father's will. Seek first the kingdom of God. Here it is. Seek you first. Look at how many of you. Fred Adams, our, past, our head Dr. Adams is going to buy you all dinner on himself with his own credit card right after church service. And he'll also refund the entire cost of my book. So just talk to him about it. He's really good. So here's the Father's will and here's your will. What do you say? What are you seeking? How do you after? And it was a long time before we got to, I remember a time, Debbie's in my life, we were just married and uh, we were contractors up in Lake Arrowhead and had a con big construction job we were doing, multi-million dollar construction job. I was only in my early 30s, she was in her 20s. And um, so I took Debbie, there was this big party, these very wealthy people in Lake Arrowhead had a big party. You remember this, do you, Mom? 
And uh, they, I mean, the place was done right, you know, in those days to see a big swan made out of ice with, you know, all of the, and everybody's drinking and everybody's partying. Remember all the gold? They had all kinds of dripping gold all over them, and they had their sunglasses on their head, which they still do nowadays. Now they just have a cap on it, but they had their sunglasses. Sorry if you have a cap with sunglasses. And uh, so they, <laughs> they just had a cap on it. And, uh, I mean, uh, sunglasses. I mean, they just were so cool. Everybody was just so cool. Debbie gets home that night and she says, uh, boy, I, I, that's not me. I don't like any of it. I don't even want to be part of it. And I asked her, I said, well, what do you want? And she says, I want to serve God and do what God wants us to do for the rest of our life. I could care less about being part of the in-group of the world. For a lot of you that are in here, you're going to have to make that choice. Listen to what the Bible says in John 4th chapter, verse number 34. I'll put it up for you. Jesus said to them, and I love this. When I first read this, I'll never forget this. When I was a brand new Christian, I happened to be reading the book of John and I read this verse, and I underlined the first time I ever got a revelation in my whole entire life. I mean, I was like 25 years old or something like that, and I circled it in my Bible, and I said, that's for me. Here's the verse. Watch this. My food, Jesus speaking, and this is what he was like. My food is to do the will of him. Notice the capital H in the word him, speaking to God the Father, who sent me and to finish his work. Oh, my goodness. And I circle that. I remember just as a young kid, circling, I probably still have that Bible somewhere. I circle it and said, that's for me. It was a verse for me. And guys, it was so good to be able to realize that the will that I was going to follow was not mine, because mine fails all the time, but I can put my trust in his that never fails. Come on, somebody. You ought to give the Lord a great big praise. Number four, and we only got another one after this, so hold on, we're going kind of fast, is number four, I love this. You have to have an attitude. Listen to this, because if you don't complete the course, and so there's a course set for all of us, but you have to complete the course that's set for you as a Christian, and you have to complete it joyfully. Joyfully means you're filled with God. You're happy about life. You know, have you ever been around... Nah, I hate to pick on older people, but sometimes older people get a little cranky. Maybe you have a grandma or a grand... Oh, shut up, James. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> James is over there saying, yes, it's me. And it's not me, James. <laughs> so he's like my kid, too. So he's just over there saying, yeah, I know, old man. So and it's not me, James. Don't do that. Uh, but have you ever been around older people and they sometimes get a little cranky and a little grumpy and stuff like that? Ever been around one that's solid and healthy and strong and happy, fulfilled? That's the way it should be. And I'm here to tell you, you have that option because you are somebody who's going to complete the course that God has set before you. I'm telling you this, listen to me. God wants to take you to your own personal promised land that's filled with blessing. All you have to do is these steps so far. But you have to, when you get in it, complete it. Because getting in it is not, it, it's, it's like the guy told me one time, this was years ago, and it's not that way anymore. He says, a millionaire will work hard to make the first million, but he'll work three times harder to keep that million. I thought that was fascinating as a young man, I heard that. A million dollars in those days was like a billion dollars today. He'll work three times hard trying to keep it. It's the same thing. You can get there with God, then you've got to complete what it is you have set out to do, and you've got to finish that course with joy. I love what Paul writes. It's a powerful verse, if you will, or about the Word of God. And go with me to Acts, in the 20th chapter, verse number 24. If you have your Bible, this is worth circling in your Bible. And he writes these words. But none of these things move me. Nor, he says, did I count my life as dear to myself. In other words, he, all the things in his life that came at him, the good, the bad, the ugly, the, you know, the temptations, all the stuff that was there, nothing that he had was of any importance to him. That's the way you and I ought to. Thank God God gives us things that bless us. I like nice houses and nice cars, and I like nice things, and there's no, nothing wrong with that. But those nice things don't have me. I have them. 
And the big deal is, guess what? I, I have got God. I'd give it all up for a moment of him. He's, he's better than a lifetime of material stuff is having God. None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. Man, I'm so important. I'm so great to myself. So that I do, might do something. Watch this. Finish my race with joy. I mean, that's really what was on his mind. I need to finish my race. How about your race? Some of you are young, just starting a race. But how about finishing the race? If You know something? If you start a race and not know what it's going to take you to get to the end, you'll never get to the end. But if you know how to get to the end of the race and you know what's expected along the way, you will run that race to finish it. And so a lot of times we start a race, we start running the race, we really don't know what it takes to finish the race. And here he comes along and he says, I need to finish the race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord to testify to the gospel of grace of God. Man, that's you, that's me. We're not here today and gone to Maui. We are here going to stay to the end fighting a good fight of faith. Come on, somebody. Last one for tonight. Last one for tonight, and I, and I love this. Number five, to live like Christ. If you want to know how the divine purpose for my life is, God wants me to live like him. He, it's, it's Christ-likeness is a great word for that. And uh, to live to be like him. I, I, I'm so far away from that at times. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those guys that's like you. I'm filled with fleshly desires and fleshly things. You know, Jesus is one who turns his cheek. And like I said, you know, I, I just want to slap the teeth out of your mouth half the time. And uh, I got a lot to do. I got a lot to go on, you know. And uh, God is helping me to do these things. Never stops cleaning us up. Can I tell you something? You don't reach a certain spot as if you made it. You're always learning. You're always in a place. I actually have a greater relationship with Jesus Christ today than I did 15 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago. Every year it's getting better and getting stronger. And I love what Paul writes in Philippians, the third chapter. You ought to write this down, verse number 13, verse 14. He makes this statement. He says, but I do not count myself as if I've apprehended. In other words, I don't think of myself as all that, finish the course. I'm pretty cool. I, got, I found out when I was pastoring after five years, I said to myself and I said to God in a prayer time, I said, God, I know everything there is about pastoring. You can trust me now. I got it all down pat. Man, I've been pastoring for five years, God. I want to tell you something. I'm, I've been pastoring for 40 years. I still am just scratching the surface of the things I ought to know. But that's what I thought in those days. Here's Paul. I, he says, I don't count myself as one who's apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forward. I, don't you love that? That's your life. Forget the past. You screwed up in the past. You made mistakes in the past. You failed in the past. You fell down in the past. But you're getting up and going with God today. Man, that's a verse you ought to memorize. And it says, uh, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forward to the things that are ahead. I got, I'm, listen, at 73 years old in a couple months, I'm here to tell you something. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. My life's not over until the day that I take the sweetest breath I'll ever take on this earth. Let me say it again. My life's over when I take the sweetest breath I ever took on this earth. The sweetest breath wasn't the first breath when I came out of my mother's womb. The sweetest breath wasn't when I married my beautiful wife and saw her coming down the aisle even so she took my breath away. My sweetest breath for me was not when my children were born and I saw them being born. The sweetest breath for me is not the awe that's on the inside of me when I see them minister all over the world. The sweetest breath for me while I'm on this planet will be the last breath I take on this planet because I'm out of here and I'm with my Jesus. And that's what this is all about, my friends, is that 
listen to this. We're going to reach forward and think, I got things ahead of me. Until the sweet breath that I'm going to take, I'm going to keep telling somebody about Jesus. And if, if, if I'm not in a pulpit area, then I'm going to write it down for my grandkids and my kids' kids, and my great-grandkids, and maybe nobody will buy any of my books, but someday one of them may grab it out of a closet and read it and change the world that he lives in. Come on, somebody. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Five things tonight, I want to give them to you once again in case you didn't write them down, that we need to look to do. Number one, serve God. Number two, I love this, seek God's kingdom. Number three is that we need to do Father's will. Number four is that we need to complete the course with joy. <laughs> I want to be joyful. It's hard when you get up in the morning and you wonder who in the heck's in the mirror looking back at you. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm going to finish it with joy. And number five, to live my life out like Christ. Come on, if God spoke to you tonight, give him a great big praise the Lord. Glory to God. Isn't that good?